Uh, so um, I'm just going to show you some uh, some data that we have collected here. There has been other uh, experiments on this, but uh, uh, we um, uh, we have uh, redone some of them uh, quite recently. So I will, I'll mainly focus on those. This is our lab, and we mainly focus on uh, uh, marine mammal hearing. So we have seals and porpoises here. And uh, harbor porpoises hear very well in water, and they don't hear well at all in air. Uh, seals hear well in both media. And uh, there has then been some measurements on uh, uh, humans, uh, um, and that's traditionally done with psychophysics. So you ask a person, many of you have done this in the, if you go to the hearing aid doctors, you do a psychophysical test where they ask you if you can hear this and that. Uh, sound and then you can uh, on top of it, you can see a staircase where you then lower the sound intensity if you answer like you can hear something and if you cannot hear it you increase it again and then you create this staircase and you start to oscillate around the threshold then you can repeat that for a bunch of uh, frequencies so you obtain an audiogram like this um, so that's the standard in air there are very few measurements in water uh, uh, but there are, they have been measurements all, you know, throughout from the 1950s or so, uh, starting with the, with the U.S. military uh, being interested in this, and later on that has been repeated. And they all show very different things. So we thought it was valuable to redo these measurements. So they are just done with a, uh, and this is all work done by my student Kenneth Sorensen, by the way, for his master degree. So uh, he has a, a person down here on the water, about a meter on the water. And uh, we, we have a light, underwater light, showing that there may be a signal or not coming from the speaker. And then the diver has to indicate with a thumb up or a thumb down if you heard in that trial. And then we run through an awful amount of trials uh, with this poor student down here. And uh, with that, you can then generate an audiogram. And it sort of looks like uh, the top one here. The lower graphs are the uh, ambient noise in this uh, pool where we are working. So if you want to compare it with uh, uh, sort of um, if you know if you want to compare these uh, graphs, you end up uh, with some tricky discussions about decibels and units that I won't get into here. This is the most traditional way to compare them in, in the intensity units, and then you see that um, the water uh, thresholds, uh, uh, hearing thresholds, are lower than in air for humans, which is not so strange. But uh, actually, the, the difference is not that big. And we see that in quite a few animals that are not adapted to underwater hearing, that they hear surprisingly well underwater, actually. And so do uh, humans. The problems for humans is directionality. And there are no uh, measurements. I think these are the only measurements done uh, so far on how we uh, to quantify uh, underwater directional hearing. Uh, uh, in air, we have a lot around, uh, it's around uh, 10 degrees or so, depending on the frequency. This is a test that uh, I believe this was at one kilohertz. So we asked the diver to go down one or the snorkeler to go down one meter and then uh, circle around while being blindfolded. So he doesn't have any sense of the direction. And then we present the sound from the transducer and we film the response by the diver point, trying to point to the transducer. And the data is uh, very random. But there is actually a pattern. So you have sort of a left, right on the presentation of sound on the x-axis, and you have the diver's perception of the direction on the y-axis. There is actually a, a funny trend. So if you are presented in general to sound to the right, there seems actually be a you, you're actually more prone to to respond to the right than the left. But the variance is awful. So the conclusion is that even though an under un, adapted animal like humans, uh, uh, we, we have a sensitivity to hear underwater, uh, the directional cues are really bad, and therefore hearing is basically not, you know, it's dysfunctional. We, if you compare with marine mammals that hear, that are adapted to hear underwater, they have exceptionally well um, directional hearing underwater. So that's the key to make use of sound underwater, we believe. But that's all I had, because uh, you asked me to keep it short. So um, any other aspects of hearing uh you know how how well we perceive um other uh, virtues of the sound field i don't think they are have been explored uh, at all as far as i know uh, Maunus, i have a question i have been talking about like the because our ears are built to hear above the water yes in the air uh, and uh, like the shape of the ear and everything makes sense here yeah? in, in but while we're in the water because our body is is uh, built out of water basically isn't it? so all the vibrations of the water are going going kind of through the through the body so it's not like only ears involved here so maybe the body involved much more than the ears actually 
hearing. Yeah, is I mean, it... eventually the, the, the sensing organ for uh, the way we perceive sound is through the inner ear. So eventually you have some uh, hair cells that uh, vibrate in the inner ear. Uh, that I think we can be quite uh, sure about. But the pathway there is interesting. So you, you mentioned all these other possibilities. The, 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 the sort of the backbone response by scientists have been that uh, it's all based on bone conduction. So uh, the sound is entering the skull and then uh, uh, transferred to the inner ear. And actually our data shows that this is not the case because uh, the bone, bone conduction is, is not efficient enough. So what we think is happening is, uh, as you say, there are other cavities. You have the middle ear is full of air. Uh, and you have the lungs and so on and so forth. You have many air cavities that start to vibrate in the sound field and they generate a cue or a stimulus to the, to the inner ear, very much like you see in fish. So we heard a previous presentation where we were discussing um, pressure sensors and um, um, vibrational sensors in, in different animals. And it's true that fish are primarily sensitive to the vibration of the sound field, but fish with a swim bladder will actually perceive the pressure of, of the using the same mechanism. So it's true that uh, you, 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 uh, the sound field is entering your body and then uh, whatever structures you have in there that can vibrate or oscillate will do so. And that oscillation will then be transferred to the inner ear. We think there is no measurements on this. We just speculate. Yeah, okay. We can see yes. that the, the bone conduction is not uh, valid in this case. That's the only thing we can say. Yeah, okay. It's just an interesting question. If uh, we imagine that humans' ears are much further from each other in the water, will it make any difference? Or it will be, will be still that, that's the That's a good question. So, uh, I mean, there are two cues in air uh, that we're using. We are both using the time cues uh, for uh, lower frequencies to tell the direction. So this is for telling the direction, right? That's why we need two ears. Uh, so we use the time cues for lower frequencies, and then humans use uh, intensity cues for higher frequencies. So that's the two cues we have. To make use of uh, time cues, uh, you need this air separation. So that's true. It would be much better for us if our ears were further apart. And maybe you could build uh, such a device. You could, uh, you could experiment with something funny with uh, earphones that would delay the sound, maybe, as if you had your ears uh, wider apart. Maybe that's for, for listeners, for audience. For yeah, each. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that could be. That's <laughs> actually been done. Oh, okay. yeah. that, that, was, that was an early form of sonar on sailing ships. Two listening tubes oh, yeah. separated. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, 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 that's true. So that about five times yeah. the distance and yeah. a human listener in the yeah. air could tell so, which dis which direction other ships yeah. were. So that, so that would probably work for a lower yeah. frequencies. Uh, the problem with the higher frequencies is that then you need the intensity cues to tell the direction. Uh, so we are using the shadow of our head. So the sound coming to our e one ear is shadowed uh, when it comes to the other and uh, to the other side, and therefore we we perceive uh, a direction to the sound source. So we use that uh, when you pass maybe one kilohertz or so. But uh, that, that's and that's much more tricky to make that work in water because of these uh, because uh, the tissue is quite conductive underwater. So the sound is probably not going to be shielded when going, you know by your skull and and uh, therefore dolphins uh, for example they have all these air sacs uh, surrounding the ears and they have actually their tooth whales the the ears are uh, separated from the skull in our you know in our case it's built into the skull bone uh the, the inner ears but the, uh, for the tooth whales they have sort of separated them so they're hanging in in uh, in, uh, in two bones below the skull uh, most likely then to uh, be able to get better directional cues so they have ex ex excellent directional hearing and in seals, it's actually a big, big question because they have the same kind of ear as we have, but they still do directional hearing very well. And we absolutely don't understand why they can do that. That was a long answer to your question. But yeah, that's, that's a perfect answer. Thank you. <laughs> it uh, made me think. Um, 